What is up down and sideways, you fantastic individuals? Welcome back. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you. And today we are doing a nice 07 salute to the LCS, to the boys from FlyQuest. Yes, they couldn't get it done. A mere maybe one Baron play away. Of course, there's no given that they win, even if they get that Baron. But start to finish, this series delivered in a way that nobody expected. And at the very least, what we can say proudly for the North American fans is FlyQuest did not shy away from a matchup that they were supposed to not be in at all. I really hope that this is only the warm-up for the rest of the series that we will have at this World Championship because FlyQuest vs. Gen G is one of the best series we have ever seen at the World Championship. Full stop. I'll take it on that one. Even with the LCS representative FlyQuest coming up just short to pull off what would have been one of the biggest upsets in world history. And, I mean... Across the board, yeah, this series absolutely had it all. You know, we had all these crazy picks that we were hoping FlyQuest would bring, and that's kind of the theme from this series and the blueprint that the West, I mean, people have been talking about this for years, but going forward, you saw FlyQuest, I think game four, they kind of play that standard Gen G meta, and you go, oh yeah, we're, we're kind of outmatched. We can't keep up with that, but when they're playing these other picks, these different styles that the LCK doesn't play, that's when the West can compete with some of these top dogs. And now you're combining a competitive three-game set that they were close to winning against Hanwha, and now this against Gen G. Despite exiting in quarterfinals, if you're FlyQuest, you're going, this was a great run and full redemption from what happened at MSI. It's a different angle to the problem of how do you solve, how do you, you know, uh, what is your handle and grasp on the meta, right? Understanding what are the priority picks, what are the strong champions, all these type of things. There is another path, the path of understanding what you can do and whether that's going hard to an extreme like someone like ls and going big into the numbers and the understanding that this is what's truly broken and what to use type of things or in that path of this is what we know what we are comfortable with what we have worked through together and that is what they trusted and you saw that in the way that they were able to execute the comfort level that they were able to bring into what was such an un you know under un understandable big time underdog matchup against Gen G. FlyQuest brought it and right out of the gates, taking that first game of the series with the way that they play. And being able to bounce back from getting smashed in game two, not getting tilted, feeling like you're outmatched. And I mean, throughout the series from team fighting, you've got Masu popping off this whole series. You're probably saying despite the loss, Masu was the better AD carry in this series against Pays. There's a lot of times where we get these type of head-to-heads. You get this type of test against an LCK, against an LPL team. And these young players, these prospects, usually in that ADC or mid lane position for the LCS, we talk them up, we hype about what you're doing and this type of matchup and everything else. But there usually is one or two moments, whether it's positioning or something else, where they choke, they throw away the advantages or any good plays that the rest of the team has then trusted into this young talented player to do masu didn't he didn't overstep really i think the only time that i thought that he was ever really overstepping a little bit too far is the one time i think you know game two he's caught by uh, or game two or game four i can't remember exactly but he's caught right by basically the first turret in mid lane for fly questions like well how can you how can you not be pushing up at that point into that type of territory totally understandable i think he was phenomenal and yes definitely not an overstatement to say that he was a more lethal option than pays on the day and, and even outside of team fighting there were moments in this series where they're going toe to toe with the macro gods in gen g that fifth game what was it three kills at 20 minutes and then they try for the spare and sneak that again oh so close to happening before it becomes disaster and even after that they find a pick and there's a 4v5 before Chovy ultimately gets a triple on smolder and then the game is really over but even after that baron they weren't fully dead and rolled over by genji in the next three minutes yeah it was an impressive game five because again so many times we get to the game five and it is that massive letdown it is not the ultimate decider that we all hope and dream of when we think of Silver Scrapes Game 5. 
This one did hold out. It wasn't necessarily super nail-biter type of one. But FlyQuest was in there. They didn't back down. They didn't look nervous or scared, uh, you know, of, of the big moment of a big baddie in Gen G in that Game 5, especially the Gen G that's leveled up after a Game 4 where they had to pull out the extreme pocket picks, the going of, you know, the classics, the Canyon World Skin Nidalee, Keen Sante busted out in Game 4, and then, of course, going to the Smolder technology in Game 5 for Chovy, which, yes, Chovy, a lot of people are going to be on him for his individual performance in this series, and I think that is a relatively fair one to go at and look at, you know, and criticize him for. But you look at this Game 5, and you look at that trust on, hey, you are taking the Smolder, and you better be able to accelerate and get these stacks popping off. Nobody better than Chovy to pick up the stacks on the Smolder. Yeah, and I think both the Smolder and the Cassidy game, Chovy, was an absolute menace in the engine for the squad. I get the criticism on the Ari performances, especially in this series. You're expecting more out of him, but it's still uh, Genji coming away. But again, if you're FlyQuest, it's so rare in the LCS, but I need to see these starting five return together for 2025. It's, it's not one of these ones where I, I don't want people to have the expectation or the understanding that the LCS isn't capable of these miracle moments, of these surprises to be able to rise up on the day type of situation. The problem is any time that the LCS or one of these North American teams has been able to accomplish something like this, just have a good showing like this, it always falls back. There's always a letdown. It is never built upon which is that expectation, which is that hope for a lot of people. That's what it has to be for this FlyQuest team. And that starts with bringing back the five members. That's got to be the number one task for Mr. Papa Smithy over at the head of FlyQuest. And it's so often teams feel like on paper they can make, uh, you know, improvements with whoever they bring over. But it really feels like this is the perfect mix of obviously veteran and rookie inspired and whip whip been such great leaders for Masu and Busio in that bottom lane. The growth from that bot lane has been incredible. And having the psychotic play style of not just Bwipo, but his own version of Hillisang and Inspired, he always needs someone who will follow up the chaos that is Bwipo. And him and Inspired make so much room for Quad and Masu to work together. It just feels like this is the perfect balance on this squad. I think when you, with what you have with FlyQuest, with Bwipo, with Inspired, of course, always going to be have their unique, interesting champions that they can push through. And again, they work really well in that synergy in that top side. But again, one of the things you saw this summer with Quad, with Masu, was that trust to say, yes, we're going to be this interesting or unique or whatever type of angle, but we're doing it to drive an engine, to put resources, to put power into these guys and they're going to get the job done we can trust them with that that's a big one again building on this for this FlyQuest team starts with bringing back those five members and not having an nrg type of split a type of season like that again you need to capitalize on this positivity on this type of trend and accomplishments for the lcs next year the series over the weekend that was supposed to be bit of a banger back and forth ended up being uh an absolute slaughter and that combined with gen g going five against FlyQuest, all of a sudden t1 is fully internationally leveled up will probably be favorites against gen g in that semi-final matchup because this was absolute vintage world's performance out of them fakers done with the 80 carries we're seeing them on on Ari, we're seeing them on Silas takeover games. Curious cooking up the Bard and the Pike. The level up from T1 throughout this event has been astronomically insane. Do you remember when we would see the Bard from Kyria and it was out of sync this year? Nuh uh uh. Not the case right now. This is a T1 that is a well oiled machine and they roll right through top esports in their quarterfinals matchup. This was again a lot of a lot of expectations for a feisty, fiery type of matchup, one that could go the distance based off of the power levels of both these teams, the history that we've already seen from them this year at international events. Didn't get that. Didn't get any of that from the top esports side. I think you can look at them and say it was a negative. It was a weak day from them individually as a team on the day. But then you can look at the side of T1. The level up that they had was overwhelming to top esports. This is a T1 where I'm eating my words because earlier this year, all the DDoS issues, all the struggles, all the slumping, I said we will not see 
NXT won at the same level and hype of excitement that they were at as world champions last year. And here we are again. A lot of people getting towards that level of hype and excitement. T1 performing like this, picking up the win, setting themselves up for that matchup against Gen G best of five. And no team in the history of the game can go from one game away from not even making it to the world championship to a few weeks later. And you're unironically saying this team's probably the favorite to win the whole thing. Nobody can flip that switch other than T1 uh, in the history of these worlds. And the crazy thing heading into this semifinal matchup now, one is T1 might be favorites against Gen G, but I'm pretty sure we have never had a Faker Chobi matchup at the World Championship, which is absolutely insane. It's a little crazy. I can definitely picture it and understand exactly where when you think through on the past brackets and you know where they were and you know okay well maybe you could have had this one or whatever we were supposed to have this one 2022 finals for the world championship a little something called drx and zeka happened to gen g so we did not and t1 they game. both got their heads kicked in uh, yeah down the line uh thanks for the reminder <laughs> that type of trip but yes Gen G versus T1 set up in the semifinals. The other side is going to be, of course, Weibo and BLG. LPL, LPL, LCK, LCK. Oh, baby, you better buckle your seats, folks. Yeah, it's always better, I think, to have not that domestic final for Worlds. So having them both in semifinals will be great. But uh, yeah, T1, I mean... They always have these teaser videos. T1's kind of the final boss, but even at MSI, it just, you know, it didn't quite hit the same. You weren't feeling as confident in T1, but now, even heading into that quarterfinals matchup, you saw, you know, so many guys have history against T1, and we really did learn that Zeus just completely owns 369 in this matchup. My God. Oh, this is a painful one because they're, they're, they're good buddies off the rift. They get along. They kind of talk to each other, of course, as, as you know, at these international events. But this is certainly one where the the results are overwhelmingly in the side of Seis' corner right now with what he's been able to do against any of these top teams for 369. Zeus has had the answer, a leveling up, still uh, a sprinkling of some rat performance in there from him, a couple choices, but getting away with it right now for uh, uh, T1 and the way that they've played. This matchup against Gen G is going to be an all-timer. I can already tell it. I, this is not going to be the Gen G T1s where you build yourself up and all of a sudden it's a 3-0 and well, we're, uh, we're done with the whole afternoon. That's not what's in store for us, folks. We got a barn burner. And we're finally going to see what is stronger, the T1 world's buff or the Gen G domination over t1 over the last few years when it comes to head uh here at this world championship but yeah so many of these fights from t1 against top esports even the casters are sitting there going how did t1 win this and how did they win it 5-0 they were so good that's what was happening out there they knew exactly what they wanted to do and top esports unfortunate i don't know if you you could put i think anybody up against them on that day and they were not stopping the t1 train that was rolling in all of these games there was never a moment to catch your breath to take a reset and go okay you, you know let, let's really we're at we're at the cliff's edge here folks let's let's you know bring it back never a chance for that one it was full t1 storming on yeah and the synergy is fully there across the board all five players absolutely terrifying heading into that semi-final tilt just because Worlds is still going on doesn't mean we're not getting our nice little dose of off-season drama and news. This, The JoJo Peon stuff's been going on. I feel like it was already a month ago we were hearing he's not going to be on Cloud9. And then there were the rumors that he's maybe going to the LEC, which I think we both scoffed at. But now, Cheap Esports dropping that, yes, he's going to be going to Mad Lions Koi as the first ever NA import to another region which is absolutely crazy and you know we've had some wild off seasons over years in the past but this is this is right up there for like reckless to G2 perks to NA for me those, those were literally the first two things that popped into my mind when I thought of you know uh, an off season rumor that initially shot down because no way this is what no that's not happening and then it happens, and you got to talk about it. One, Dojo Pyon to the Mad Lions Koi, as, as rumored, 
this one stings and i think for a lot of people it's, it's a complex one of course because of the way that things went last year in the exit and, and you know there's rumors again hearing about why the exit comes through from cloud nine a lot of people still believe and trust in the talent that someone like jojo pyun can represent for the lcs for the north american region and to see that go elsewhere is a is a bitter bittersweet type of moment i think the rest of the lec the lck and the lpl are all going oh first time welcome welcome to the big boys club losing uh, some talent like this at this type of point you really are a major region now that you can be like this it stinks i think this is a uh, obviously then you know just from the perspective of the mad lions and the lec very exciting move this is a real a player that presents incredible upside not only on the rift but off the rift or what type of you know marketing potential you can do with that for the mad lines koi it is an area that needed improvement a drastic one to pick up and provide more high octane power jojo pion does that now will he mesh with the rest of the group is he gonna be there at 10 a.m 9 a.m whatever your meeting is does he know that Europe is on a different time zone? That's got to be the things that we nail down for him. For oh, man, I'm six hours late to everything now when I show up. But, I mean, honestly, this is surprising. You're going, why would JoJo opt into this? But then you kind of think about it. What's available in the LCS, right? He's not going to be on Cloud9. I don't think Team Liquid's going to be moving on from APA. FlyQuest, we're hoping, keeps the same squads. Even going down to 100 Thieves, you're probably not getting rid of uh, Quid over there. And all of a sudden, you're going... It's Jojo's going to be on, like, I, I want to say Immortals, but they're not even there anymore. He's going to be on some CB LOL team, so I'm sure he might have burned some bridges in the LCS with how things ended. We don't know the full details, but this seems like a full hard reset for him to go over to EU to a team that was just at Worlds. He probably watched Rescow. He thought he could play a lot better than that, and... He's going to have something to prove, and for a dude who already has a huge chip on his shoulder, it's just gotten a little deeper now. Well, hey, you can you can saddle up with the guy in the LEC who probably has the biggest chip on his shoulder, deserved it or not, in El Yoya in the jungle for Mad Lions Koi. It's a hell of a that combo. I'm I'm excited for that one, thinking about the potentials again, going on the upside part of it, knowing that, yes, was very excited about Jojo Pion and Blabber. And we never got to see really the full synergy, the full upside from both of those players uh, in that combo. So need to see that in this iteration for the Mad Lions Koi. This is a bold move for them to make. Absolutely one of the ones to, to shift the meta, shift the change in what has been going on in the LEC. We talk so much about needing to see change, needing to get someone to actually push and challenge G2. Why not bring in the LCS for that? And, you know, it's obviously we don't know what the rest of the MDK roster is going to be. I, I assume they'll probably keep the rest of them. The bot lane played well at Worlds was kind of their standout. Mirwin has obviously been the X factor for this squad throughout the year. So I'm expecting most of the rest to stay the same for them. And if that's the case, yeah, I mean, this should be a top team uh, in Europe vying for a title. And it's it's just crazy to see an NA player going over there. But in return, the other bit of off-season news we're seeing, of course, in classic off-season news, it's it's always leaked DMs on Discord that are leading to these roster moves. But we're seeing Niski coming back to the LCS to join his boy Fudge. Contracts on Shopify Rebellion along with a to-yet-be-named import AD carry and support from the LLA I feel like Niski is the first player to ever go NA, EU, back to NA. I'm sure that's not happened before. I, I think that if there was a, a, a League of Legends, you know, professional video game, which I, I know League of Legends, live with me here, guys, franchise sports type of video game going through this, this trade, uh, Jojo Pion for Niski, that one's getting blocked. No, no way that's passing through. Even understanding that the computer doesn't get the nuances of why Jojo Pion's got to leave the LCS type of one. You're denying this one, but Niski comes back on, on, you know, a low level of where his stock and status is for for things with SK. I think he's obviously. You look at some of the statistics; the numbers are pretty good. But when you go to the big moments, the clutch times, do you get it done against the big teams when it's needed to show that you are a real deal? His performances have not been there for SK as well. That's the knock against him. But he comes to the LCS. He will be a competitive player here, joining back up with Fudge. 
to see nine days, a bit of synergy there with him. Contracts coming on in. The LLA bottom lane. That is an exciting one for them, really going the full America's experience. I've got a feeling that this roster could work. It could hit the ground running. Maybe they've got the communication all sorted out. Everybody knows what they want to do. They play to their strengths. That works out. The expectation, I think, is that it's not going to work that type of way, and you're going to find this as a middling, floundering type of team in the LCS. Yeah, and obviously, depends who this bot lane actually is going to be. There's so many question marks around this league as a whole. I imagine outside of FlyQuest, there's going to be movement on every single top team in the LCS. So hard to grade, but yeah, this really does just scream sitting in that fifth sixth kind of zone maybe with potential for top four but at the very least fudge and contracts very happy to see being on squads because absolutely deserving to still be starting caliber players yeah i think uh, no matter how negative or down you were about fudge from the cloud nine run and how things ended there was nobody i think saying that okay well this guy couldn't deserve a starting spot in the lcs and the same thing for contracts with how poorly things went with NRG this year. I think a lot of people, again, were stepping away from that going, this is someone who deserves to keep going, deserves to keep trying to push it uh, in that regard. When you're looking at Niski stepping on in with them, I think this is it's a good mix. But the question, again, is when you go at the LCS, there's two spots for Worlds. You've got Team Liquid. You've got FlyQuest. Cloud9, even going budget, should be in that conversation for two, three 100 Thieves in that conversation for 2-3. Do you really feel like this Shopify Rebellion lineup is there? Well, if they get the very best from Fudge, and if Niski is able to deliver in the big moments like he wasn't in the LEC, then this roster can work. Because Niski has been able to deliver in big moments for Cloud9 in the LCS. We didn't quite get that experience back in the LEC. It's, it's a crowded affair when it comes to Worlds in this new America's Cup. But once we get more info about it, we'll be there to break down many more offseason moves, I'm sure. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.